Good evening, everyone. I'm flattered and honored to be here. Uh, what a, a wonderful introduction uh, to be able to speak English this far from uh, where I grew up outside Toronto is indeed an honor. So thank you very much. I, uh, I don't quite use reading glasses yet, but I'm right at the point. So these are sitting here just in case things get a little out of focus. Um, early on in my career, my interest was in uh, the notion of religion as used by certain scholars in the field. We've been talking about it in the class that uh, uh, I'm involved with here for the week. Um, a certain troublesome way of defining religion as somehow being autonomous, one of a kind, uh, somehow uh, influenced by but uncaused by all kinds of other historical factors. And uh, since then, uh, that was my dissertation, that became my first book. Uh, since then, increasingly, my interest has moved f much wider than that to um, the very fact that anyone uses the category at all. Um, so this paper, I think, is a little broader than my early work, if, if that's what one is familiar, uh, if one is familiar uh, with anything that I've done, and I'm flattered that you are. Uh, I'll stick to the text, try not to read too fast, and um, I'll give you an idea when we're near done. Near the end of his visit to the continent of Africa in March of 2009, or taking the lead from the Vatican's designation of an apostolic journey, and I won't be making these air quotes all the time, but keep in mind that my interest really is in the category, the category use, what it implies, what interests it drives. So I'm probably nowhere in the paper talking about religion. I'm always talking about the fact that people talk about religion, the fact that part of the social domain is divided up and named religion or what the Vatican designated as an apostolic journey, or what the US press simply called his pilgrimage. Pope Benedict XVI relied on the well-established distinction between magic and religion when speaking to a group of Christian uh, church bishops, priests, and nuns during an invitation-only mass at St. Paul's Church in Luanda, Angola. As quoted in the New York Times and as confirmed on the Vatican's website, the Pope closed his homily by focusing the faithful's attention on those at risk because they have not yet heard the church's message, posing to his congregation the following rhetorical question, quote, who can go to them to proclaim that Christ has triumphed over death and all those occult powers, end quote. The strategic pairing of licit and illicit, which Benedict used to distinguish those practices termed sorcery, from what he termed, termed the Christian tradition, has a long history of usage with which scholars of religion are more than likely very familiar. Important to bear in mind when studying those who divide up their social world in this way is the principle that, after describing the participants' own use of such designators, scholarship requires us to re-describe all such first order or folk classification systems, seeing them instead as instances of other far wider cross-cultural or historical processes. Processes which do not necessarily share a common identity, but which instead serve as analogies, exemplary of something that the scholar finds curious. In the case of the Pope's distinction between false sorcery and true religion, I believe that following this principle would be relatively uncontroversial for the majority of scholars. Those who would undoubtedly advise that we would be terribly mistaken to begin our study of the Pope's address by assuming that the categories sorcery and religion refer to something substantial and thus distinguishable in the acts that had been signified in that way. Instead, such scholars would advise us to see in such a classification system evidence of a prior set of social interests that the speaker, in this case the Pope, was putting into practice by means of such bounded pairs of concepts as pure and impure, magic, religion, Interests that, in this case, had something to do not only with the goal of reinvigorating the collective identity of those Angolans in attendance by inspiring them to proselytize. For in this way, the superstitious them would willingly someday be con converted to the totalized us. As Durkheim might have concluded, through their participation in the ritual known locally as the Mass, the so-called quote-unquote heroic and holy heralds of God, as Benedict phrased it, became unified, insomuch as they could understand themselves, those with an eyesight and earshot, as clearly being distinguishable from those not in attendance, the ones living in the fearful grip of magic. 
When re-described in this manner, the address that the Vatican and the press alike termed a homily ends up being but one species of a far wider genus popularly known in the English-speaking world as a pep talk, akin to the rousing speech that might be delivered by an inspiring coach prior to the big game, creating a shared sense of affinity among members of the home team by juxtaposing them to a caricature of their cross-town rivals. Given that the modern term homily derives from the Greek homolos, meaning simply a gathering of people, even a crowd, or more specifically, a gathering of troops, then once redescribed in this manner, we see that the Vatican and the press's shared use of this local term homily to name Benedict's address may have told us far more about the function than either of these two sources ever could have imagined. But what made the report of the Pope's pep talk stand out for me was not because it illustrated so well that much is at stake in the designations that scholars use when studying people's behaviors. Though, as I hope I've just demonstrated, we learn much by substituting the more generalized words to visit, audience, and pep talk for the participant's own choice of apostolic journey, congregation, and homily. And I'm interested not even because of how nicely its analysis demonstrates that seemingly unlike first order things can profitably be compared in light of a second order curiosity, a curiosity more than likely alien to the people under study. Instead, what caught my attention was how difficult it would be, it would likely be, to get those scholars of religion who so easily see through Benedict's transparent distinction between magic and religion, to historicize the conceptual distinctions that provide the enabling conditions of their own academic work, not least being the sacred-secular pairing that animates our use of the category of religion. For much like the term apostolic journey, the category of religion itself is a local designator, I would argue, peculiar to a certain historical period and specific groups of human beings. Although unlike the term apostolic journey, it is one that people worldwide have adopted, no doubt grudgingly in some cases, and elevated to the status of a cross-cultural universal. That is, while many of us would judge it insufficient for a scholar to be content with merely describing the Pope's rhetoric, or worse yet, simply adopting it and then trying to identify the inherently magical qualities of the illicit practices that so concerned him, I nonetheless find in the work of some who claim to historicize the category of religion no less troublesome assumptions concerning the presumably stubborn significance that somehow remains after we dispense with our Latin-derived signifier. Thus, despite the now commonly accepted practice of historicizing the word religion, I often find in such work that some prior persistent concept ends up being naturalized, despite the supposedly rigorous attention to history. It is this strategically partial historicization that I wish to document and then to problematize in this evening's talk. Although I could cite a number of examples, given that I'm in Hanover, consider the conference in Bochum that I attended in the fall of 2008. Like many in the field today, uh, its organizers conceptualized religions not as static things, but as ever-changing objects in motion. I think this is part of a long-range research consortium centered there that I was honored to participate in. A theoretical shift signaled by the replacement of singular nouns by their plural form and an emphasis on studying people's observable practices rather than on intellectual abstractions such as their beliefs. This move from the one to the many and this emphasis on local difference over abstract similarity is by now quite common in our field. So much so that the turn towards studying what is now known as religion on the ground, public religion, embodied religion, material religion, suggests that a generation's worth of critiques of essentialism have had their desired effect, and that we will no more find scholars assuming that their object of study is unique, timeless, self-evidently interesting. And so for the critics in the field, we might as well now raise a mission accomplished banner and then get on with the business of studying religions, significantly in the plural. In the plural, on the ground, and on the move. Knowing that a little theory, much like a pinch of salt when cooking, has carried out the necessary task. Or so one might think. After looking at a, li a little more closely at the work of some of those who now investigate the category of religion, it seems to me that troubles persist despite, or perhaps in the guise of, so-called advances. This was made evident to me during the final session of that conference in Bochum, 
For example, in a paper presented by Jose Casanova, the noted US sociologist and author of the very influential book, Public Religions in the Modern World, 1994. A book on the worldwide deprivatization, or better put, publicization of religion over the past decades. An argument that has played a crucial role for many in how they now conceptualized religion and its relation to the state. Like a number of those who focus on the category of religion, Casanova has become interested in the study of secularism. Though, of course, this is hardly the old secularization thesis. <clears throat> Instead of uh, predicting the eventual decline of religion in our modern world, Casanova described the manner in which such notions as church and state are binary pairs peculiar to a worldview that goes by the name of secularism. Conceptual pairings that once entrenched in laws and institutions, provide a framework in which modern social actors establish and negotiate their social worlds. But it is a framework that, or so this argument goes, the so-called return of religion is now challenging, to such an extent that scholars along our field's cutting edge have begun to imagine what the role of religion will be in what they call a post-secular world. Now, I had no disagreement with Casanova's position on the binary nature of the sacred-secular pairing and how it provides the conditions in which we, as social actors, think and move in the modern world. Or more correctly, I had no disagreement until he waffled, I thought, on thinking seriously about the historicity of binaries and how they function. For his analysis concluded by arguing that the notions of religion and the secular were early modern Christian theological concepts as if those things that we today commonly identify as religious, such as the social group known by its participants and scholars alike as Christianity, and the literary genre, genre known by its authors and scholars alike as theology, somehow preceded, preceded and thus caused the subsequent ability to name those things as religious. Now I fully understand why some people persist in making the move of imagining religion, or perhaps we should not say religion, but instead uh, the sometimes preferred term in English, religiosity, to pre-exist the terminological distinction between religion and not religion. Somewhat as if prior to the invention of cooking and prior to Levi Strauss's rigorous examination of binaries, early human beings simply had a natural sense that their food was raw. This seems to be the assumption that I read in their work. For imagining religion to precede the word religion, what amounts to reviving the 19th century notion of natural religion, enables scholars to retain the deeply felt baby, variously called experience, faith, authenticity, spirituality, meaning, religiosity, while throwing out the merely contingent linguistic bathwater, bathwater that some of us know by the Latin-derived name that we, or so the critique go, goes ethnocentrically export when naming babies in other people's hearts on distant shores. The trouble, however, is that under the guise of progressive historicism, I believe a rather conservative argument concerning naturalness of identity and the transcendentalness of value is being reinscribed. For although we may no longer use a once dominant vocabulary to name certain discursive items, these items are left untouched and merely used for new tactical purposes whether you agree with those purposes or not. For example, look through the recent criticisms of the work of such prominent, though as I've argued elsewhere, problematic, US Indologists. I have in mind here the critiques, and if you're familiar with these critiques, we'll be talking about them in the class I'm involved in. I have in mind the critiques here of the work of Wendy Doniger, James Lane, Paul Cartwright, Jeff Kripal. Many of their critics are rather upset with how so-called Western scholars a category that, despite a generation of anti-Orientalist critiques, occupies a curiously central place in the work of their critics, how they use what are described as alien imported theories to study what the critics know as their own actual religion. For example, as Professor Balangangadara, writing in the foreword to a recent collection of essays entitled Invading the Sacred, published in India in 2007, according to him, many Indian intellectuals, quote, realize that Western explanations of their religions and culture trivialize their lived experiences. By distorting, such explanations transform these, and this denies Indians access to their own experiences. It can thus be said to rob them of their own inner lives." End quote. 
The corrective offered is simple enough. Indian scholars must get off the sidelines, as the book's introduction phrases it, and take back their religion from the neo-colonialists, a move that will result, or so it is argued, in their reclaiming of their very selves. What I find interesting here is that the critics do not adopt the far more rigorous position by assuming that European-derived designators, such as the quoted terms in his text, culture and religion, as well as the increasingly popular category, lived experience, they're not saying that they have no analytic value when it comes to examining, in this case, life on the Indian subcontinent, either today or in the past. Instead, in a move reminiscent of the famous quotation from the opening chapter of Otto's The Idea of the Holy, those, excuse me, where those who have not had the so-called deeply felt religious experience are asked to put the book down, the charge they level is that outsiders misrepresent what the self-described participants already know to be their true religion, their unique culture, and their actual lived experience. All terms that, despite their obviously foreign pedigree, are now curiously assumed to be in a one-to-one -one step with India's most authentic and enduring selves. Some of you may be familiar with the current, right now, going on uh, debate on who owns yoga. Yoga has been appropriated and denaturalized, and the same critique is now being made. What must go, not go unnoticed, I think, in this linkage of authenticity, selfhood, nationalism, and religion, and for anyone familiar with the work of Wendy Doniger, it may be more than apparent that this linkage is made by actors on both sides of this debate, but in the service of rather different conceptions of society. But what I think must not go unnoticed in this linkage is that despite what some observers might read as a laudably critical attitude toward Western imperialism, such critics are surprisingly conservative in their responses, for they seem to have little choice but to play by an imported and internalized set of rules. Rules that presume this inner thing that some of us happen to call religion to be self-evident, eternal, and a universal possession of all humankind. Rather than changing the rules of this scholarly game altogether, and for instance, establishing in India and elsewhere the cross-cultural scientific study of, say, caste, conceived as a carefully nuanced historical and theoretical study that adopts and then elevates this no more or less folk concept to the status of a universal possession of humankind, they instead try to beat those whom they are criticizing at their own hegemonic game, which I think is a quick but no less useful description of the post-colonial situation among diaspora intellectuals. The irony, then, is that even if so-called Western indologists lose the battle over how to best define and study this thing some of us in the world call Hinduism, they nonetheless, I think, win the imperialist war. For now, their so-called others are, for lack of a better term, Westerners too. For they can apparently only think themselves into identity and agency by naturalizing a technical discourse developed elsewhere and then defending not just the proper way to study their religion, in quotation marks, but the proper way to be a Hindu, whether in Mumbai or Montreal. My interest in examining the work of those who historicize the category religion, while yet presuming some natural pre-linguistic religious domain, what I'm calling religion before religion, what they call religiosity or faith, has to do with the fact that I think it it is this two-step process of social segmentation, that is, seeing some human practices as naturally distinct from others, and linkage, seeing some sets of uh, zones as being uh, set apart that, uh, despite being buried deep in the human heart, they are nonetheless unified in all human hearts. I think it's this process that constitutes, this two-step process that constitutes this thing we call modernity. For example, we see this two-step identity formation process by which matters of difference and similarity are managed in the just-read quotation from the forward to Invading the Sacred by Balan Gangadhara, no less than in the Pope's previously cited pep talk, when, for example, in response to some imagined relativist conversation partner, who, despite seeing the difference between witchcraft and religion, advises, leave them in peace since they have their truth and we have ours, to that imagined conversation partner, the Pope replies, quote, if we have come to experience that without Christ, life lacks something, that's something real, indeed the most real thing of all, that it is missing, 
we must also be convinced that we do no injustice to anyone if we present to them and thus grant them the opportunity of finding their truest and most authentic selves, the joy of finding life, end quote. Despite the difference in the content and contexts of these two texts, exemplified in references to some homogeneously existing thing called the Christian tradition on the part of Benedict, and in Balangangadara's interest in identifying the, quote, properties that characterize India of today and yesterday, end quote, both writers, as products of those social conditions that we know as modernity, employ the very same techniques, the intertwined rhetorics of unique experience and enduring collective identity, to create an impression of a historical unity in contradistinction to those pursuing contrary interests and competing identities. And the point where this segmentation linkage process is perhaps most evident in our field is in the discourse on religion before the category religion. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So to return to documenting the problem of those who historicize the word yet naturalize the concept, as already indicated, I find in such work a rather traditional and to me problematic theory of language, inasmuch as concepts are assumed to float free of history. For a field that prides itself with taking history seriously, in fact, attention to the historical is among the most common ways that students of religion distinguish themselves from their object of study. This presents us with a number of problems that deserve far more attention than they have so far received in the work of those interested in faith's apparently recent escape from the interior confines where interfering secularism supposedly imprisoned it several centuries ago. For example, thinking back to Casanova's paper in Bochum, we should more carefully consider the now commonplace claim that the category religion, along with the binary pairing of church and state, was invented by Christian theologians. As suggested earlier, this claim prompts me to ask to what the pre-category religion signifiers theology and Christian refer in this kind of analysis. For without contemporary scholars projecting the modern distinction of religion and not religion backward in time, and then selectively naturalizing just one part of this pair, the religion part, I'm not sure why we as scholars continue to see something called Christianity as an item of discourse, much less conclude on the redescriptive level that it is a causal force in human history. For example, without using our modern concept of religion and all that comes with it, to distinguish among literary genres, I'm not sure how the group of rhetoricians that we know as theologians stand out as any different from a host of other propagandists, myself being another. Now, of course, they have a first order vocabulary peculiar to themselves, talking about such things as sin and salvation, and they work within their own institutional settings, but so do all propagandists. We all have our own vocabulary and our own social settings. If our job as scholars is not to sanction these apparently discrete identities by taking for granted the means that create them, but, as proposed in my opening example, to study how these identities become possible and reproducible in the first place, then as soon as we move from first-order description to second-order redescription, such terms as theology, let alone as sin and salvation, ought to be dropped from our analytic vocabularies entirely. For we should see such first-order domains as analogous to other culture-wide processes. In much the same way, I'm unsure what to call Christianity if we drop the category religion. Is it then a mass socio-political movement that uses philosophically idealist rhetorics and ritual references to ancient victimization and capital punishment to mobilize their members? But more than this, without the discourse on religion, I'm not sure why we assume some discursive it will remain to correspond to whatever new signifier we attach to the artist formerly known as the Christian religion. This is why I'm troubled to find in the work of many who critique the category religion the intact boundaries of those things that we used to call religions, such as Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, etc. Would not a new analytic discourse rearrange the human material altogether, regardless how people themselves arrange their identities, name themselves, and authorize themselves? Sadly, regardless of what we call it, many of us end up studying the same thing as we did before because a focus merely on the word religion leaves untouched what Michel Foucault might have termed, quote, the internal rules of the reasoning process, end quote. Much as the no doubt well-meaning replacement of the word Negro 
and colored and then black, at least in the US, now with African American, leaves utterly untouched a logic and a system of practice that make it seem sensible and thus natural to classify and organize people based on the presumably enduring relationship between identity and skin color. Merely changing the term doesn't change the logic underneath it. Now, of course, I recognize that people long before us used the designator theology and Christian, to stick with my example, but, and here's the point that I think is too easily overlooked, just because the same words were used does not mean that they signified in the way that they do for us today. For as my friend and colleague in Canada, Bill Arnell, put it when commenting on an earlier draft of this paper, quote, Ignatius of Antioch in the second century uses the term Christian, and even weirder, Christianity. However, he is not opposing these labels to anything like secularity, which would be utterly anachronistic. Rather, they are identity labels for group affiliation. Thus, to be a quote-unquote Christian, he writes, one need not have a concept of religion, but simply other identities that are not Christian. End quote. Thus, without the category religion and its relations to a series of other categories, behaviors, and institutions with which we moderns think and act our particular world into meaningfulness, I have no idea what we'll mean when talking about Christianity or theology. Nor do I know why we, as self-described scholars of religion, will feel compelled to be the ones doing that talking. Simply put, without the discourse on religion, that is, without scholars merely adopting and thereby sanctioning how some people in the world understand and represent their social identity in distinction from other people's? Would not the study of what we commonly know as early Christianity simply occupy a relatively minor place in the curriculum of a department of classics? So much like the role played by the creative corporate accounting in our present global economic crisis, supposed gains in historicizing the category religion, I think, hide undisclosed losses. For another example, consider the now commonplace preference for plurals over singulars. The gain in arriving at a more nuanced approach to cross-cultural and historical difference is overshadowed, I think, by leaving unexamined just what it is about all those Judaisms that makes them members of the same family. For in the proliferation of the many, a singular identity remains intact and utterly untheorized. I think here of Talal Asad's influential critique of the anthropologist Clifford Goertz's definition of religion as a cultural system. If we grant to Asad, as he phrases it in the introduction to his 1993 book, Genealogies of Religion, quote, there is no single privileged narrative of the modern world, end quote, then we will not only critique the export of the concept of religion, as he does so well, but we will also scrutinize how it is that, when such scholars do away with the universal reified concept of, say, Islam, they somehow still know who the Muslims are and thus who to go study. That always fascinates me. When you get rid of Islam, you still know how to study Muslims. That is, <clears throat> despite, the despite the proliferation of plural identities, to quote Assad again ironically now, a single privileged narrative of the modern world yet remains. But this time, um, it's nonetheless retained. For even when we let our universalized category go, there somehow still remains a necessary and natural identity lurking below the contingent multiple surfaces, and I find this rather problematic. And it is just this sort of naturalization that occurs when scholars privilege one part of what is supposedly a binary pair so as to conclude that, as I said earlier, theologians created secularism. We see in such arguments a form of faulty logic akin to someone assuming that people just knew that they were outdoors prior to the invention of shelters. In both cases, identity is presumed to predate the discursive conditions necessary to think it into existence in the first place, much as if Adam just knew he was a man prior to the creation of Eve, to borrow a quick example from an ancient Semitic creation tale with which some of you may be familiar. When it comes to recent studies of religion and not religion, what we therefore often find is simply a repackaged version of the old, old story of how the primitive world was once homogeneously religious and with the advent of modernity uh, and its uh, imposing opposition of church and state, how it was disenchanted. We could go so far as calling this, I think, the new secularization thesis. 
It is a thesis and evidence, for example, when scholars critique the noun religion while yet relying on the adjective religious. And I see this all the time in the literature. I find this so fascinating. For instance, consider Muhammad Zaman's interesting Princeton University press book from 2002, The Ulama in Contemporary Islam, in which the British colonial use of the category religion is, in my opinion, in his book, rightly named as a socio-political management device. Yet having freed himself from the oppressive category religion, as he phrases it, the author is still somehow able to speak of people's faith as being different from their political orientation, going so far as to invent the awkward term religio-political, one word, and using it as an analytic tool as if it's actually naming something. And he's somehow still able to identify such items as religious history, religious scholars, religious authority, religious traditions. Somewhat reminiscent of a mythical phoenix, the adjective, which unlike the reifying concept religion, has the supposed advantage of naming an authentic quality of people, or so the argument goes, miraculously arises from the ashes of the noun's critique. Yet if we agree with Zaman when he argues that, quote, British colonial officials routinely invoked what to them were familiar and often self-evident concepts and categories, end quote, to manage the colonial population, then why are we not also entertaining that his and our, quote, familiar and often self-evident concepts and categories, such as the presumption that religiosity predates our modern ability to name things as religious, maybe it's also up to something. For I would argue that, much like the Vatican's choice of the term homily, so too the presence of the adjective religious in the work of those who critique the category religion tells us far more about the scholarship than its authors may have imagined. Although I think that the sleight of hand that produces the adjective's miraculous resurrection is what we ought to be studying, that is, we need to study the discourse on religion and not simply the word religion. Looking over the work that has so far appeared over the past decade or so, in my view, this is not a widely shared assumption. In fact, reading such work sometimes put me in the position of imagining myself to be participating in the academic study of sin, to go back to a category earlier. Um, a no less local noun than the category religion, and thus one that is easily possible to imagine elevating to the status of a cross-cultural universal. Moreover, I can imagine how some members of such a scholarly field might come to see and then become critical of this obviously imperialistic move, critiquing the analytical utility of the category sin as a scholarly tool and therefore dropping it entirely from their work. I can imagine that scenario. Yet the curious thing would be finding those same scholars using the adjective sinful to qualify the things that they study as if dropping the noun sin and then replacing with, say, gluttony and greed, would somehow suffice. If this imagined scenario is laughable, then I'm not sure why we tolerate the signifiers faith, spirituality, authenticity, religious, and religiosity in the work of those who claim to be doing something more than merely paraphrasing and in adopting, applying, extending, and thereby naturalizing the claims already made by the people whom they study. Which leads me to conclude that, the two of, uh, that of the two best-known Smiths in our modern field uh, in, in North America, each of whom represent contending sides of the issues that I have too quickly surveyed in this paper tonight, Wilfred Cantwell's work is lamentably, from my point of view, far more representative of the modern field than Jonathan's. My hunch is that this is because the strategic social interests that can be accomplished when using the former's <coughs> distinction between interior faith and secondary observable practice, interests that are doggedly undermined by the carefully composed comparative studies of the latter Smith, these interests are easy to extend using the former Smith's work. For by helping us to distinguish between the pristine individual person on the one hand and his or her subsequent social situations on the other, the scholarly tradition represented by Wilfred Cantwell Smith Presents, prevents us from ever examining the institutional practices that led to just this or that view of the individual in the first place. Thus, a limitation is placed upon our scholarship, for while we can historicize language in terms of which our meanings are exchanged, we can never historicize meaning itself, let alone its presumed source and presumed destination, the self. What I am arguing is that despite its seemingly progressive tone, a highly effective depoliticization of the social 
is taking place when we limit our critical work simply to the word religion. Tied as it is to notions of interiority, autonomy, privacy, individual choice, authenticity, lived experience, and thus enduring social identity and intentionality, the folk and scholarly category religion is part of a wider discourse of the modern universal subject, that which today finds its political home in the notion of citizenship, its economic home in the notion of consumerism, its kinship home in the notion of race, to name but three sites where a typically modern individual is created. I therefore advise reconsidering our critiques of the category religion and much of our current work on the secular, seeing the persistent habit of assuming people to have rich, active inner lives as but one more folk site where a specific form of what Foucault aptly termed governmentalité has been globalized, a process that has legitimized certain types of subjects and specific types of social relations. For as I see it, the mission of scholarship is not to reproduce and thereby normalize such local processes, whatever the political ends to which they are working, for it is the process that slips, for this is a process that slips sui generis religion in behind the mask of its adjective and its plural, as if some enduring value mysteriously lurks in the background of our contingent vocabularies. Instead, regardless how the people we study may understand their own systems of classification, and regardless how close some of these systems are to each of those that we use in our non-scholarly personae, I presume that our work as academics requires us to take such processes seriously as history, and thus as contingent, as fleeting, and therefore as requiring labor if they are to appear to us as permanent acquisitions of this thing some of us call the human spirit. Recovering this labor, I contend, is the task of scholarship, a task that I think has yet to be accomplished in work on the category religion. Thank you. Thank you very much Ooh. for this very inspiring uh, lecture. And I think that a lot of comments and questions will come up. Now it's your turn, and feel free to ask questions, to give comments, and to be critical as he wants you to be. I'm excluded from this. <laughs> <laughs> I hope my paper is not too confusing. It's still this will become the uh, a chapter in a book that Bill Arnell, the person I named who's a Q scholar, if you're familiar with New Testament studies, right? That's what Bill does, but he also writes in this area. Um, that'll come out, I think, next year with Oxford University Press. So we are ahead of the time. Perhaps I... You can email them to me. Perhaps I can ask a question with regard to one of the sentences you said, if I remember uh, well. You said, religions can be historicized, but cultures not. Is that what I Well, I, I was trying to uh, phrase what the position I'm critiquing would say. Yeah. And I find that very troublesome in much of the work that, that uh, the people who... Um, when we meet at conferences who, th who think we agree, that's the kind of work that I'm looking at. And it seems to me when I read their work and talk to them that there is a very troublesome traditional notion that they're employing that I have no way of really describing but by saying that words and concepts for them seem to be different sorts of things. That somehow they presume that, I'll give you an example, silly example perhaps, but I, you know, I love looking at textbooks as data and and uh, uh, John Esposito and two others, I've written on this, I forget the other people's names, produced what has become a pretty widely selling uh, Oxford University Press World Religions textbook in North America. Uh, John Esposito, you may know, very well-known American scholar of Islam. And uh, early on, they have the Let's Define Religion chapter, as you would expect to have. And they say, picture yourself in ancient Rome to the reader. And already I'm very bothered by this because now this is a pretty bad history. Now we're time traveling now. But I see it's written for a first year audience and you know. 
And you go up to someone who can understand you, for some reason they can now understand you speaking English, right? And you say, what religion are you? And the person looks at you puzzled, right? Because they don't have the concept religion. So here with the one hand they're giving something, right? But then the next sentence they say, but then you rephrase it and you say, are you religious? And the person says, yes, of course, isn't everyone? So in that move, they're saying that our modern category of religion is somehow linked to a post-late 18th century, the invention of world religions as organizing concepts. But the thing it's naming for these authors is somehow seen to be transcendental, religious, the adjective, religiosity, religiousness. And it strikes me that what they give with the one hand as rigorous historians, they quickly take away with the other. And somehow this local designator that is local to an awful lot of human beings today, it's been very successful, obviously, in moving from, from Latin-based roots, European certain language families, but now it's presumed to be in kind of a one-to-one -one agreement with human nature, thus such that I assume we, most of us probably think, I grew up thinking, everyone has a religion. Well, for me that then becomes an opportunity to do little mind experiments, to say, well, there's all kinds of human beings the world over who use all sorts of local classification systems to arrange their world, move within the world, identify who to trade with, who not to trade with. Uh, what would we do if they arrived and tried to elevate what is obviously to us, their local classification system, to become a transcendental value of the human, such that we apparently have a caste and we don't even know it? Well, we would laugh at that, how silly. Well, I want to be a bit of an equal opportunity scholar in that move to say, well, Religion, the concept religion, the category, our very way of using it to sort people, you know, the census. You know, sooner or later, you're going to say what religion you are. Um, uh, your example, your example is um, quite obvious in a certain English-speaking context. But I wonder whether it's really true. Because um, I would give two examples where I have a problem. One is, I think, in certain parts, I'm not so well uh, uh, informed about that, but perhaps some of the students can help who know these areas much better than I do. But uh, my guess is that in certain areas of Eastern Germany, for instance, mm -hmm. people wouldn't understand if you asked them whether they are religious. <coughs> what would that mean to them? Uh, I, I think religion is somehow, in, in a certain sense, a great academic word. Um, one of the things I was always struck was when I gave the introduction to the history of religions, I talked about religions during the whole semester. Nobody asked me what I was talking about. It was presumed it was somehow very academic way that everybody understood what it was. And they waited for presentations about Islam, Hinduism, and so forth. But I wonder whether these people would really know what religious means. And moreover, my second example would be because in Germany we use religion. But I, I don't know which equivalent we could use to ask this question in languages outside the European context. For instance, in Arabic, what does religion mean? I don't know, religious. The religion is used as a term that serves as a translation for certain things. But I wonder what religious would mean in Turkish, in Arabic. I couldn't quite say. We can ask. Uh -huh. One of the tracks here, mm -hmm. how they would translate religious. I don't know if there's any um, in Indonesia. In Indonesia, you have Agama, for example, the book you were talking about, mm -hmm. the world religions. Mm -hmm. I think the second author might be uh, Mark Woodward. I'm not sure, but I think it's. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, I can't recall if there's three. They're all three American authors. Is Woodward. A Brit, or am I wrong? What's, I have no idea. I can't. It might have been. I can't recall. Okay. 
don't ask for religion, you ask for yeah. agama. So, so you have agama. But agama, as you ask if somebody is religious, you actually ask if he believes or if he prachaya. And so it's not the distinction of religion and... But my trouble is looking for the functional equivalence because we come to the situation already knowing that our category is transcendental. We know these differences, but right. the problem we have is how to bring it to a broad audience. So if I write, write books about Adama, if I have titles, let's say, or in my introduction chapter, I would write, well, asking an Indonesian what Adama do you have? Okay, so this, first of all, I would have to define Adama. So what is Adama? So I would have to take the Indonesian categorization of Adama to distinguish it between belief systems, which could be religions in our academic view as well. Or but you might have the problem to use that for Confucian, uh, Confucianism. Confucianism is Agama. Is so Agama. Meanwhile, but it was yeah. not Agama yes, before until it was. 2006. Yeah. So but see, for me, the interest is a bit of a meta interest. The very fact that we know to talk about the things we're already talking about. Yeah. How do we already, we haven't started talking about bowling. Yeah. See, that to me, that's the move. The very fact that we know what functional equivalents more or less meet and Confucianism means we're already in the discourse on religion. We already know it's a universal possession of humankind. We already know the terms don't quite meet up and so we have to have some and that's already part of my data. I'm already interested in how did we get there because I don't think it is. I think, uh, uh, use the category of religion as your own tool, define it as you wish and you know, but it's that move that presumes and here's our old essentialism. You know, this is sui generis religion by another name because somehow we know that our tool is a universal possession of humankind. And I'm thinking, well, wait a second, you know, there's a very difference no, from, you know. This, what I what I refer to is uh, that uh, religious would be a general term that is understood by everyone. Uh, it, uh, religion perhaps is a very Eurocentric, but religious is a term that I hardly can translate into other languages. Well, just with the Indonesian yeah, context, I, of course, I, if you take, I have to, I have to if, if, if you take this example that you translated by in what thing do you believe, yeah. of course, then you have a description of what religious means. Meanwhile, they use the word religious as well in political um, discourse in Indonesia, so they have this. Well, very few people don't anymore. They <laughs> Anyways, they, this just to give you one example where those terminologies that seem to be universally understood can also run into difficulties as soon as you apply to a very concrete linguistic context. Mm -hmm. Okay. Perhaps some other problems. Is there a hand over there? Yeah. Hi. I have a question. If you see that, if you're talking about public discussions or discourses, um, do you see any uh, indication or maybe evidence that you can, that happened before a very uh, a strong focus on having this type of discussion about religion, however it was categorized? Do, you see, do we have any um, ideas or the implication of even having this kind of study to um, I'm sorry I'm a little lost still the implications of, of this debate even how or does it happen in public settings or I think this kind of of, of study that at least I find interesting never happens and that's why I hopefully can keep writing but but no, I'm being a jerk um, because I think at least in my argument the category of religion used in a very particular way linked to notions of selfhood individual interiority experience and this is this is the discourse that I mean is so deeply intertwined in how we think ourselves into existence as agents in the modern world and so to critique this, to draw attention to it, to try to historicize it means to call into question 
fairly large, well-established and intertwined institutions and mechanisms that make my, not just life possible, but my identity as Russell, my ability to say I and me. But I think this category of religion doesn't cause all this. Please don't think I'm making the, but it's deeply intertwined into this. And I would say since, you know, late 18th century onwards, when this word, you know, 17th, 18th century, and we start to see this word in the literature, uh, no longer naming social identity. I'm a religious, right? I'm a member of a monastery, I'm a member of a group. And the invention of that interiority that other people in other disciplines start studying, hence the notion of subjectivity, the notion of the self. And that's my way into people like Foucault. That's why I find these people very interesting, because I'm thinking we as scholars in the study of religion, I think, are part of this historical movement that we've seen over the last two, two and a half centuries in the European world, the North American world, the colonial world, and now worldwide, such that you can't imagine human beings today not having a nationality. It's impossible to imagine that. I am Canadian. Though we all know, if we've done that kind of study, that nationalism is a very recent invention, that people carrying passports to move around the globe is a fairly recent invention in the human history. We'd probably be in error to think that citizenship or citizenness was some eternally woven in part of my identity. But it's been an incredibly successful way to manage human beings, it seems. And to achieve certain sets of interests that I, I love the fact that I can turn my TV on and do certain things in Facebook and, you know, I, I, but to call that into question takes a tremendous amount of effort and undermines a number of things that, that um, historicizing can undermine things by pulling away their authorizing strategies, techniques. So that it, thus it makes this discussion extremely difficult to have, such that when you meet people who study secularization, they will assume, my argument, sacred secular, that the sacred part of that pair is eternal and it was always there and the other half just kind of got invented somewhere in the late 17th century. And I just think that's, that's really poor scholarship. It's like saying uh, the, uh, the, the concept of we was always there, and then we met some other people, and now we invented other. That's just bad scholarship. And we would, but yet in our field, we routinely grant people who study secularization, we routinely grant this to them. That thus, we know there was religious people in the 12th century, in the 11th century, and that we just know that. And then along came this thing, secularization, and it hemmed religion in, and it privatized it. And I just think that's, that's really poor scholarship. To take seriously a binary pair is a binary pair. And prior to that, who knows how human beings thought themselves into agency. Let's try to study that. How do you study that? Now we're gonna, are we going to do an archaeology? It's a brand new challenge. But I'd say let's not take our contemporary conceptual pairings and simply pitch half them backwards in time as if they're eternal. Um, I, I don't know of a, a, a good example, but that doesn't answer your question, I don't think. I started to ramble. I was just, um, maybe I just put it in a different way. If you can share the opinion that maybe to, uh, to characterize oneself, to, to correct, to, um, to make identity, you may have to uh, discuss about different religions in terms uh, that that is different, that is not us. So mm -hmm. is, I just feel that like, uh, this is a main, uh, a main um, influence on the uh, public discourse on religion. I, I, I think, okay, how do I, I'm just trying to connect to that comment. I, I don't disagree. Um, the things that in society, we were talking about this earlier, the things that in society get to count as religion generally often will strike me as um, socially safe sites of difference. How that's not me, the, the things you're talking about, identity, I'm not that. The things we call religions, well, the students in my course tomorrow are going to read a piece by Karen Armstrong, British uh, scholar of religion, widely publicized, a lot of bookstores, you go in North America, there's all the Iliade, all the Joseph Campbell, all the Karen Armstrong. And she's right at the front of the list talking about um, uh, he, I, uh, Islam was hijacked. So the argument about authorized, essential, normative, real versus derivative, wrong, right? So the things that get to be called religion in this analysis are uh, sites of difference that are rather socially, politically benign, that aren't threatening to a certain kind of set of status quo interests that probably benefit me. I'm, I flew here on jets and I have a good life as a professor and so I, I don't, I don't uh, question that. Um, the things that fall outside that 
uh, they're not religions. They're, there's difference, but they're, they're too different. And thus we come up with a host of vocabulary terms, cult, fanaticism, ideology. We have all kinds of different terms we use for that. So it strikes me that if that's what you're saying, I think we agree that the category of religion seems to be a crucial category for managing an economy of difference within certain prescribed boundaries. Boundaries of tolerance, acceptable. <coughs> Outside that boundary, um, you would never use the term religion, right? These would be termed cults uh, or, or, or whatever. So it strikes me all along, I, I've tried to write on this, that the category religion is part of a liberal democratic vocabulary. Uh, what gets to count as religion? Is it allowable? Is it not allowable? Should it be taxed? Should it not be taxed? These kinds of debates. I'm not sure about the situation in Germany, but in the United States, and Jonathan Smith is one who pointed this out to me a long time ago in his writings, uh, it's the Internal Revenue Service, the uh, tax people of the federal government who actually define religion. That's where it's defined in U.S. law, and that makes a lot of sense because the category is used in U.S. law to determine who will and will not pay tax or have certain kinds of privileges, and it makes sense that that's where it's defined. And if you look up the define, it's a definition, it's a, a wonderfully circular, vague definition. You know, religions are religion-like groups. You know, but well... this applies to all disciplines. Of course, with different categories and categories. But if you take sociologists, for instance, or even psychologists, then you have a certain vocabulary which is inside you, uh, mm -hmm. vocabulary, not used by other people, or at least not in the same sense, and this uh, produces corporate identity mm -hmm. for the discipline. Mm -hmm. I, th I think the problem in our field is that the scholars don't just see it as their insider tool that we collectively use to do our work, that we're curious about people, that we see our term as having a universal transcendental signification power. Uh, I'm, I'm personally not a Margaret Thatcher, you know that she was always teased for saying there's no such thing as society, it was a more complicated uh, comment than that. But to me, if a sociologist would agree with that, you know, society or social formation, or let's get a more technical term, is my technical term for talking about certain collectivity things that I think are happening. You know, I can't go find society. If, then I can, I can get along with that sociologist well. But if they're thinking that, the anthropologist thinks that there's actually culture out there somewhere. And I'm thinking that's the error with our category of religion. We really can't see it simply as a categorical tool we use to name certain sets of human actions, organizational techniques, whatever we want to call this, um, that strike us as curious and having something to do with each other. And the something that to do with each other is not in their core, it's in us juxtaposing them. They're analogous. We want to put them beside each other to talk about them. If that's the work we do, I'm all for it. But I've yet to see, generally, scholars of religion, sooner or later, that category is naming something, not the soul, we don't use that vocabulary anymore, but that's naming something they think in the heart. It's transcendental. All human beings have it. Of course, a person in the ancient world was religious, if they, even if they didn't use the word. And think, wow, like that's, I wouldn't want to be told I had a caste even if I didn't know it. I don't think I do. I know some people in the world organize themselves that way and talk that way and make sense of their world that way. Great. I don't think that's a universalized category and I think our category of religion, we ought to be careful with how we use it. Drives me nuts. Because that's, to me, that's the, 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 in English, the sleight of hand, the magician who's doing prestidigitation, the quick movements of the hand to, to fool you, right? Card tricks. I think that's all those terms are doing. That this is why, but that's a very strategic move and it's a very handy move, I think. This is why I think Wilfred Cantwell Smith, he was a Canadian scholar, but became famous in the United States, founded Harvard's program, on Comparative Religion, well-known Islamicist. That classic move he made, which he didn't invent, a lot of people before him did this, that there's faith and transcendence, and then it's the secondary outward cumulative tradition that it inspires. Like that move right there is a strategic move, I think, because now you can seem to be historical, tradition changes, 
But the inner experience, and you've read Smith, and it's a very dated work, early 1960s, 70s, you know, early 80s, I guess, still even. But it reads very similar to much of what I read today, uh, that there's still this enduring faith. It's philosophical.